Uh, hi, good afternoon, folks. This is Rajiv Eskana for Immigration.com, the law offices of Rajiv Eskana PC. Today is April 16th, 2015. This is our bi-weekly telephone call for our community. And by community, I mean anybody who is a human being. Um, we are uh, going to answer all your questions, first the ones that are posted on the forums, then the follow-ups, after which we will open the floor for new questions. I'm not sure I will have enough time to do a lot of questions, but it is my intention to answer all new questions um, as best as I can. I only request that you please keep your questions short uh, if you can. That way we will be able to divide our time fairly. Okay, um, I also pointed out to people who are already here and some of you have just logged in. Um, while I'm talking, you are welcome to uh, tweet me, Immigration Calm. Uh, my Twitter account is Immigration Calm. And you can also uh, see that Twitter feed on our homepage. <coughs> Excuse me. On the right hand side, uh, you'll see my Twitter feed. You can tweet from there. Okay. <clears throat> um, let's begin. You've all heard the disclaimers when you logged in. Uh, <clears throat> this is not an attorney client privilege telephone call. We are providing information to the best of our ability. All right, let's get uh, started with the first question from KB Desai 4. He is or she currently on sixth year of H1B visa. So the visa is expiring in September. The question is um, should I get the extension done, then get a new visa stamping and come back if I'm traveling? Look, I, I am of the opinion that you should avoid filing or applying for a visa as much as possible because you never know how it will play out. Even though you are working for a very good employer and uh, directly working in-house and uh, you know all those things are there, but unless it is absolutely necessary, I would just travel on the old visa. Okay, so another reason that motivates me to say that is that once you have an I-140 approved, if Obama comes through for us, which he's, in, which he's expected to, you might be able to file your 485 very quickly without waiting for your priority date to be current and then get your advance parole. Once you get your advance parole, you can go to Canada and get your visa stamping done. If they get you stuck there, you can always come back using your advance parole. So I think that's the proper way to handle it. I am disinclined to advise people to go for visa stamping uh, unless it's absolutely necessary. Actually, you know what? I forgot my own um, um, procedure. I usually answer the questions I have labeled frequently asked questions first. So let me skip on to the frequently asked questions first. Requirement for extension of H1 beyond six years. This is... Uh, Question number seven from S. Santra. He says, or she says, um, I've got about a year and a half left on green card. Uh, strike that. Year and a half left on H1. So how soon must I start my green card? And the answer is, there are only two ways to extend your H1 beyond six years, right? One is that you have an I-140 approved. So PERM is approved, I-140 is approved. And if you're an EB-1 person, then your I-140 is approved or NIW or EB-1. So if your I-140 is approved, we don't care when your green card was started, whether it was PERM-based or direct filing of EB-1, you are entitled to your H-1 extensions on a three-yearly basis. So that's one method. The other method is your PERM was filed a year ago or your I-140 if you're an EB-1 NIW, your I-140 was filed a year ago. In, in the case of first anniversary, you will be entitled to one year H-1 extension. Instead of, I, in, in case of I-140 approval, you'll be entitled to three year extensions. Okay, I normally open the floor for frequently asked question related questions only. So if you have any comments or questions about requirements for extension of H1 beyond six years, which I just discussed, press star five on your phone, please. Star five. 
one question. All right, uh, let's go ahead and open the floor for that question. I remind you, no new questions, only follow up on this question that I discussed. Uh, Illinois, I'm sorry, got the wrong person. Uh, Illinois, go ahead, please. Uh, my, my case is I'm not in US. I have come back and I'm trying to re-enter using the remainder option of H1B. Okay, hang on, and, hang on, hang on one second. Uh, hang on one second. So for one, me, one uh, I was at. I have just put you on mute. You're not listening. Give me a second. I need only questions that deal with extension beyond six years right now. So new questions will have to wait. I'm sorry, your question is not related. I'm going to have to go on to my other frequently asked questions. But I'll get back with you in due time once we are done with the questions that are posted. So please um, stand by. OK, let me go on to the next question, next frequently asked question. Uh, this is another frequently asked question where people ask us, where should I apply for a US visa? For example, look at the case of Harendra. Harendra is an H-1B national, wants to apply for his wife, who's Sri Lankan. She's living in India legally with his parents. Uh, can she apply for H-1 from India? And the answer is yes. See, um, and this is the requirement for visa stamping for, um, from US. If you want to apply for a US visa, you can actually go to pretty much any country. They're not obliged in that country to take your application, but usually US consulates don't turn people away no matter which country you are from. They can, if they cannot verify degrees in case of, for example, uh, H-1 visas, or they cannot verify your family ties, for example, in case of tourist visas and in case of student visas. They can ask you to go to your home country, but there is no harm in asking for and apply. As of right, where do you have a right to apply? Where you live on a long-term basis? Let's say if you are on a student visa in Australia, you have the right to apply for a visa to the United States from Australian consulate or US consulate in Australia. Um, or where you are a citizen. So if you're a resident of one place, citizen of another, you can apply in both places. That's your right. Everything else is called third country national processing, TCN. So in TCN, almost always consulates will entertain your application, but they may not be able to verify your degrees or your family ties. F1 visa, H1 visa, tourist visa, these become uh, problematic, but you can certainly try. There is no harm in trying, okay? The only time TCN does not work is if you have been out of status. So if you have been out of status for even one day, under the law, the TCN option is taken away. Third country nationals will not be entertained if they were out of status, unless there are extraordinary circumstances. In practice, however, I have seen the consulates don't really make a big deal of out of status. Of course, unlawful presence is another thing. So for you, Harendra, there is absolutely no doubt your wife, who is a Sri Lankan citizen, but is living in, in India with your parents legally, can apply for a visa to the United States, H-4 visa, from India. Anybody has a question about visa issuance from third countries? Press star five. No new questions. Visa issuance, H-1 visa issuance, I'm sorry, visa issuance from a third country, any kind of visa. Star five, if you have a question. Once again, I remind you, I'm, no, I'm following my Twitter account. If you have something that comes up, tweet me immigration.com or from immigration.com homepage on the right hand side, you have my Twitter feed. You can um, just enter some messages there if something is wrong or you have some questions. Okay, next frequently asked questions. It's another one that's asked a lot. How soon can I change employers after getting green card? Okay, I've answered this question many, many times over the last few years, but let me do it one more time. Green card, which is employment-based, does not require you to enter into slavery. It requires only this. 
on the date your green card was approved, it was your intention to work at your job indefinitely, indefinitely, not permanently, indefinitely. So if I got my approval today, and today I had, I had the intention to continue working indefinitely for the next few days, months, years, but a week later I got a better job, can I leave? And the answer is yes, I think you can. But let's say I already have an offer in hand and I got my green card and I want to move. Um, would that be considered to be indefinite? Probably not. The government can take an objection. But even there, if the job is same or similar to what the green card job was, I think a very good argument can be made under AC21 portability. So currently, the law only requires you to have indefinite intention, but on the date you got your green card. However, once green card is approved, um, if your intention changes, I do not see any problem. Anybody has any follow-up question on this issue, press star five. Follow-up question on this issue, press star five. One. Okay, once again, I remind you, no new questions, just follow up on this issue. Florida, go ahead, please. Florida. Hi, um, I just wanted to clarify, you said that um, indefinitely, so once the green card is approved, and then your reason for changing job is just because let's say you're moving from Florida to New York. So, and it's maybe not a better job or the same level of job. So you're saying it has to show that it's a better job, maybe with a better pay. So that would be an acceptable reason. But if you just want to move from Florida to New York, it wouldn't be acceptable as a as a reason to change jobs after the green card was approved. No, I misled you probably. Uh, most people, when they change jobs, they change either because it's a better job or for them personally it is better. For example, you are sick and tired of living in Florida, you want to go live in New York. That's, that's an acceptable reason. You actually will not ever have to explain it to anybody, but sometimes during naturalization, if at all that question comes up, actually after the passage of AC21, American Competitiveness in the 21st Century Act, which allows you to change jobs anyway, uh, this issue has not come up very frequently, okay? So I don't think it's gonna be an issue and, and I do not believe you need to justify it to be a better job. If your heart desires to be in New York, then so be it. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and let me go on to the next frequently asked question. So here, Tutti had some questions about H4 EAD rule. H1B visa expired April 6th. Applied for change of status to H4 in March. Still waiting for approval. Can I apply for H4 EAD on March 26th? I thought it was May 26th, Tupti. I don't think uh, the dates are right. I believe it's May 26th. Uh, there's a notification on my Twitter account. Let me just make sure, okay, that's just a follower. Um, so I'm not, I'm actually um, monitoring my Twitter account also in case you guys are tweeting me. So um, first of all, Tripti, it's May 26th. And can you apply while a change of status is pending? I certainly believe so. I don't see any reason why you should not be able to. Let's wait and see if USCIS um, states differently. But in my opinion, an EAD can be applied after uh, on or after May 26th, even if change of status to H4 is pending. Um, can I apply for I-140 after H4 year is approved because my green card is also going on? Yes, there is no law that stops you from applying for a green card while you're on H4 EAD, so certainly. Is it okay if I stay on H4 EAD to continue processing of my green card? And the answer is yes. So Tukti, um, you can start your green card, continue your green card, or even finalize your green card while you're on your H4. Okay, anyone who has a follow-up question on these two issues that I discussed, applying for EAD while H4 is pending and processing green card while on H4, press star five. No new questions, please. Star five for follow-ups. 
star five on your phone. Okay, no questions. Good. Let's go on to the next frequently asked question. Also on H4 EAD, can I own my own business? Yes, you can. Can I? Do I have to run my own payroll? You do not. A business owner often does not get paid. So the only caveat I would have is this. Make sure you got a backup plan. If your EAD runs out for some reason, it's not renewed. You should have somebody who can run the business while you don't have any EAD. Okay. So recruit a family member or a friend uh, who can run the business if you fall out of uh, EAD uh, permission. Looking at my, uh, yeah, Adhruv, yeah, if you are, if you sent me a test message, um, yeah, it came through. So I'm, I'm, mon I'm monitoring my Twitter feed, as I said. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I'll come to the rest of these questions under this frequently asked question later, but I wanted to club all the frequently asked questions up front. Let me also see if there's anything else left on frequently asked questions. Uh, no. Okay. Let's go back in the order that things were posted. I answered the question number one already. Let's go to question number two. Uh, actually, number three here. I'm an Indian citizen living in Canada, getting my Canadian citizenship in a few months. I'm an entrepreneur with a business of tax filing, <clears throat> filing tax returns. How can I move to U.S.? Well, the only thing I see in your background unless you're a professional with a degree, then you would have options like TN or H1. I think you should look into Treaty Investor, E2 Visa, or uh, if you have half a million or a million dollars to invest, um, and EB5. Somebody just raised their hand. Let me get to that um, one second. I hope you have a follow-up question because I'm not doing new questions at the moment. Ahandan, Virginia, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, yes, uh, Rajiv. Uh, it's regarding the H4 EAD. Um, uh, can we have own a business? So the thing is that uh, myself and my wife both are on H1B, but anyone, one of them can convert to H4. I mean, H4, and then you can get the H4 EAD. So is there any process? Is it possible? Yeah, why not? I don't see any problem with it. This question has come up many times before, and I've always answered, sure, one of the couple can change to H4 EAD, and uh, if you both have green cards going, they can go on as well. Okay. Prasadji. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Okay, so getting back to our scheme of things. So as I was telling to Rameshji, who has posted about Canada. So if you had a professional degree, you could look at TN, you could look at H1, but if you have the money to invest, you could look at E2, which is Treaty Investor, or EB5, which is um, half a million or a million, depending upon where you invest, okay? Uh, those are the only options that I see that are quite obvious. Uh, next question is, by the way, these questions that I'm answering now, I will answer all the questions that have been posted. Then I will open the floor for follow-up questions. I have a Twitter note, one second. Uh, yeah, I am getting message. Um, I think, um, again, I don't know if this is somebody who's just sending me messages on my Twitter account or somebody in the conference just wanted to know if I'm getting the message. The answer is yes, I am. Okay. so. I'm currently on H4. I'll answer all the questions, then I'll take follow-up questions on posted questions, then new questions. But I will answer all questions. Whoever is here, I will make sure I answer their questions. I only ask you to keep it short so we have enough time for everyone. Um, I'm currently on H4, applied for H1 through employer A, uh, based on my approved I-140, completed nine years on H1 before I had to come to H4 because of the H1 extension dinner. Then another company, um, well, the employer backtracked on the offer and they received an RFE, never responded to it. So you went to another employer and they are filing an H-1B now. Will there be any issue? And the answer is no. It depends. I mean, if the RFE that the old employer did not respond to had to do with your qualifications, yes, it can become an issue. But if it was basically 
a, uh, an issue of the employer's qualifications, then it's not a problem. So normally, walking away from an RFE is not a good idea for an employer. Um, but for an employee, it will, it will be probably irrelevant because unless your qualifications are implicated, there really is no worry in that regard. Um, is there anything to be done here um, in the H-1 filing? Yeah, you have to tell the employer uh, that you had another H-1 going. I think there is a question on Form I-129 on I that asks you for your, uh, I don't remember if it's date last H-1 was approved or applied. So whatever the form asks, you have to, of course, provide that information. Uh, but the RFE, unless it deals with your qualifications or your background, is not an impediment to the next H1. If you're an H4 and you get an offer from another company or th three other companies, you can have five H1s going on at the same time. Um, as long as you've not uh, contractually obligated yourself to any issues, immigration law does not prohibit filing multiple H1s through different employers at the same time. Okay. Um, and uh, you are very welcome. You you have some very nice words to say. Um, okay. Are there any issues which I should take care of? Can I transfer my H1 with employer B to C? See, once the H1 is approved, you cannot start working until your H1 is approved because you are an H4 status. So once the H4 is approved, H1 is approved, of course you can transfer like everybody else. So I don't see any problem with that. Um, so let me go on to the next question. Dr. Patel, I have actually talked with him. Um, he had some question about green card through investment uh, and I've already actually talked with him. Uh, Dr. Patel, if you are here and you still have some follow-ups, I'll be happy to take them up. Um, with the other questions that we will do. So we, I've already answered your questions. Next is Pioneer09. Uh, Praveen says affidavit of support. Well, uh, Praveen Ji, for the affidavit of support, the law is that the beneficiary's assets can be counted. How exactly that works, I don't remember off the top of my head, but you are thinking along the correct lines. If your mother-in-law does not have uh, enough um, finances, you can um, look into it. I cannot answer your question offhand, but it's a line of inquiry that should be followed. So your assets can be counted towards the sponsor's um, ability to, uh, to stand in for your affidavit of support. Also, you can get a joint sponsor. Somebody else can also. It doesn't have to be um, a family member. Even a friend can. But you cannot. You cannot be a joint sponsor because you are not a green card holder or a U.S. citizen. Only U.S. citizens and green card holders can be sponsors on um, affidavits of support, I-864. Okay? Uh, next one was a frequently asked question. Already done that. Um, so here's a question from Yankee Doodle 007. Okay. Um, 10 years of experience, now almost 14. Previously tried EB2 uh, based upon 10, 10 plus years experience. You see, that's where the problem is. Uh, just having 10 years of experience does not automatically entitle you to an EB2. You have to be a person of exceptional qualifications. And that's pretty much the standard of evidence that they are requesting these days. It's pretty much almost like EB1 level. So it's not possible for 99% people to qualify for EB2 based upon 10 plus years of experience. Um, now your question is, it got denied once under EB2. Now they have filed under EB3, but they're not giving you any documents. Uh, so can I apply for EB2? I'll have to look at your resume, but generally speaking, I would say no, unless you are an exceptionally, exceptionally qualified person. Okay. You'll see the instructions. Uh, you can go to immigration.com and look for uh, EB1 uh, classifications, and you can see what kind of what they require 
uh, to be the degree of evidence. That's kind of where you will have to be. What kind of questions should I post my employer? I'm assuming what you're saying is, how can I get my employer to prove that they have filed another green card? Well, when the perm is filed, you can ask for a screenshot from the, from the lawyers. And if the I-140 has been filed, you can ask for a copy of the receipt. Uh, but if the employer doesn't want to provide any of those things, there's really not much you can do. You can try filing a Freedom of, Freedom of Information Act request, uh, strictly speaking, actually, Privacy Act request, FOIA slash Privacy Act request with both the Department of Labor and with USCIS. Uh, see what comes up with that. Uh, Rudra wants to know about the option of EB-5. He wants to invest money into an existing business and expand by opening different branches in other towns. That can be an option, Rudra. Another thing is, um, you said that this will uh, increase employment by 200%. That's certainly a possibility. Also remember, your investment has to be only in a new business. And new business is defined as any business that was started after November, I think it's 1990. So really, uh, any place where you invest, you are investing in a new business. Uh, there's some gray area there, whether you have to preserve the jobs or create 10 new jobs. But in your case, that's, that's just theoretical debate because you are going to create new jobs. And as long as you're creating 10 jobs, we don't really care. You don't have to restructure the business. You can if you want. Um, but it appears that this could work as long as the investment amounts meet the legal requirements of 500,000 or a million. But if you're creating jobs in a non-designated area, it may be a million. So I hope you're on the phone. I can do a one or two follow-up questions for you. Next question is DSM-918. I'm on EAD through my wife's 485. Current EAD set to expire March 21st. Received the new AD, there was some error on it. Sent it back don't have a card. So my last EAD expired on March 21st. I've been working on it. Is it legal? Well, you know, here is the problem. Under the strict letter of the law, you should not be working unless you have any EAD. But if you look at your entire circumstances, to me, it appears that you are perfectly legal to work. The trick here is as long as your I-9 can be prepared and it has been prepared, I don't think anybody's going to come after you for working illegally. Can, are you legal in the U.S. right now? And I believe so. I believe so. Okay. If they made a mistake and you're trying to get that corrected, I think you're okay. I have a Twitter feedback. Oh, just some new followers. Okay. I'm, I'm just monitoring my Twitter account as we are talking in case somebody wants to tweet me with new questions or, well, or with any comments. You don't have to. Um, so I think that answers your question, DSM-918. I think you're okay. Not your fault, but you can always contact your congressman's office and make them um, light a fire under USCIS's, um, let's not be indelicate, but they should be moving on this thing. So the next question is Bhavna Sharma. Um, we're having trouble getting non-availability of birth certificate for my father, um, who's 78 years old. Um, I think you should try to get an affidavit of non-availability because it becomes very complicated to process a case without a non-availability um, certificate. So um, even if you have to send somebody there, and I think there are some, even some career services in India that can actually do it for you, um, but you should get a non-availability. It's not that complicated. Uh, all you need is somebody to say that there's no record of his birth, and then you can use your affidavits. Okay. Owen has been in touch with me. Um, he had a couple of questions, uh, even emailed me a couple of times. So I have a question about H1B and EB2. Can I have a W2 and a 1099 from the same employer? You cannot. On H1, you are not allowed to have a 1099. You cannot be an independent contractor on an H1. Also, how does USCIS make sure that the employer actually pays the salary? And that was approved for the applicant. I'm assuming you're talking about green card. See, H1, if the employer is not paying the salary, the wage and hour division of the Department of Labor would come down 
very hard on the employer. But once the green card is approved, there's no monitoring mechanism. Nobody's going to come and take a look and make sure that the employer is paying the salary. If they are not, you should leave. Okay. Next question is Anand overstayed L1 visa by five months. Um, so basically, you are saying that USCIS gave you five extra months by mistake. Will it cause any problem for my green card application? I don't think so. When you are not taking advantage of a mistake made by USCIS, um, you know, I don't see why it should be a problem. But the, the only issue I have is, should you be leaving USA? That's something you should be discussing with your lawyers and working out a comprehensive strategy. But in an in, in, in inadvertent uh, situation, not, not your fault, should not cause you damage as long as you don't misuse it. USCIS's stand has been, look, if we make a mistake and give you more time than you deserve or are entitled to, um, and you misuse it after having found out that you know, you've been given more time, we can consider you to be deportable. But I personally think they don't usually uh, take those kind of drastic measures. But my advice is to avoid being in that situation. I have another Twitter notification. Um, this is a question. So I'm going to open. Trupti says, um, well, let me let me come to the end of the call, and I will take care of this, Trupti. Just sit tight. Um, there was a tweet from Trupti. OK, so going back to Anand's question, as long as you're not continuing to misuse it, I think you're OK. All right? So get together with your lawyers to figure out a comprehensive strategy for yourself. Next two questions were fact. We have answered them. Andrea is a Canadian citizen, L1 visa, um, and she's worked on some pretty um, high-end technologies like big data, Hadoop, and HANA. Um, actually, I fooled around with Hadoop too, just, just for fun. Yeah, it's very interesting. OK, um, do not do well due to my company and IT companies. OK, I want to invest and get status. Well, if you're a Canadian citizen, as you say you are, of course, um, you should look at the E2 option, which requires lesser amount than an EB5 option, but it doesn't get you a green card. E2 visa is great because once you invest a certain amount, you can um, continue working in USA and E3 visa can be renewed indefinitely. Um, um, don't raise your hand right now because I'll I'll ask for hands at the end of this 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 round. Okay, so don't raise raise your hands right now. Um, and I hope you're here, Andrea. You can ask me more specific questions. But look into E2, uh, PT Investor, as well as EB5. Uh, by the way, guys, E2 is not an option uh, for for people from India because it's a country to country treaty. Um, USA and India don't have a treaty. Pakistan does, Canada does, many other countries do, but not India. So the link says, my friend lost his wife in the US a couple of years ago. US citizen children are there. So he's waiting for his green card pending AOS on his wife's application. Uh, hang on a second. You know, the survivor benefits laws, you've got to look at them carefully. I don't remember them off the top of my head. I think the survivor benefits laws require you to be in the US. But I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to your questions off the top of my head. So first thing to look at is because his green card is based upon his wife's application. OK? Um, I would be very careful. Please have your friend follow up with their lawyers and make sure that they're doing what they need to do. And normally, people can be in India while their AOS is going on. But in his case, there may be some other restrictions. Uh, so, And he may not be able to convert to CP. Please have this followed up. I do not know the answer off the top of my head. But I can, I can certainly make you aware of a potential area of problem. Uh, Raj, 99999. Uh, I-140 is approved eight months ago. I'm on H-1B. Uh, till 2017, planning to change my jobs. My present employer will revoke my I-140. You know, here is the problem. 
A few years ago, USCIS used to say, uh, if your I-140 is revoked by the old employer, we'll take away your priority. And about four or five years ago, they came up with the opinion, okay, no, we won't do that. We will let you keep your priority date. As long as the I-140 is not revoked for fraud or not revoked for having been erroneously approved, you keep your priority date. Yesterday, actually today I did a consultation where somebody's naturalization application was denied because when they got their green card, their priority date was not current according to the USCIS because uh, the old employer on whose I-140 they had based their priority date and then subsequently filed another I-140, that old employer had withdrawn the uh, I-140. So we are kind of confused again. Are they taking away your priority date if the old I-140 is revoked? They shouldn't be. I looked briefly at the regulations. The regulations do seem to suggest that that can be done. USCIS can take away your priority date. I am still confused. So I'll, I'll post something on my blog once I'm able to figure this out. It, it's, a, it's a mess. It's a mess. Um, we'll see uh, how it turns out. So for you, Raj, only thing I can suggest is if you want to maintain your priority date, try to stay where you are for now until we figure this thing out. Okay? Maybe a few days, a week or so. Uh, Consult underscore GC is on L1A visa, 15 years of experience, managerial capacity. Um, is an org chart required? Look, L1A is concerned only with your internal employer. So if you are working for employer X at client site Y, we don't care who you are supervising at employer site, uh, uh, at client site Y, uh, unless they belong within your employer X's organization, okay? And they also don't care who are reporting to you from India, like you said. Okay. So um, I don't think um, I don't think you should do anything to which is less than absolutely forthright. So don't try to hide any of these issues. Uh, and immigration officers do they look at networking sites like LinkedIn, etc.? Yes, they do. Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, all the social sites are open to USCIS and they are frequent visitors to these sites when it comes to investigations. Okay, so yeah, but in any case, you shouldn't be hiding anything from the government. I, I also want to warn you, if you hide something and you get caught, um, if it's to the level of a misrepresentation, you'll be permanently barred from entering USA. I have three more tweets, let me look at them. Um, Raj is on the phone. Uh, how can my company harm my chances to revoke my priority date? Raj, I'll get to you in one second. Let me finish. He said my voice is breaking. Okay, let me open this um, as soon as I'm done with the last question. I will do all the follow-ups on posted questions. So Jai Ho wants to know, I entered USA on immigrant visa, but I, I'm not able to get my physical green card. I've looked at your whole situation. You've tried everything, InfoPass uh, and Ombudsman and everything. I think you should try the congressman's office. That usually is the most effective in these kind of cases. So go to your congressman and explain to them the problem. They should be able to fix it for you. Okay, I'm done answering the questions that were posted. Oh, no, there's one, one, no, two. Oh, there's a bunch more, two more. Okay, sorry. Um, Rohit K, change of status from F1 to H4 to receive EAD. Currently, I'm on F1, uh, spouse on H1B. Question number one, is it possible to file a change of status from F1 to H4 while in USA along with a request for EAD? Yes. How long do you expect to get an H4 approval on EAD? Do not know. And there is no clarification on that. Should I change? While I'm in USA, or should I go to India to appear for visa interview, then re-enter? I do not know. I can't say that one is better than the other necessarily. Um, just because I don't like people traveling for visa, I would probably want to do it within USA. The bigger question, um, three, 
with India EB2 PD being April 2008, my spouse's Feb 2010, should we do a change of status from F1 to H4 now? Or should we file for 485? Well, you should do a change of status because whether you're on F1 or H4, which is your next question, for 485 filing purposes, it does not matter. I prefer you to be on H4 um, for reasons that F1 does not support the filing of the 485 uh, and still remain in existence. Um, let me try to phrase it better. Um, some visas are dual intent visas, like H1, H4. You can have a green card good. F1 is not. So when you file green card, it could destroy your F1, but it doesn't take you out of status. Okay. Uh, but I think H4 is the better visa for 485. Um, but the filing itself does not require you to be on H4 at that time. I wouldn't worry about it. Next question, uh, Monica and Anna. No, talking to the wrong people. Rajiv here. I have my H1B visa stamping. Monica is in IT. Anna is a paralegal, a uh, supervisory paralegal, but she's a paralegal, not a lawyer. Um, I have my H1B visa stamp petition filed by employer A, visa stamped in December. I'm still in India. Employer B is interested in finding me job, um, but states you come to USA upon entering to USA, do not work for employer A. You shouldn't do that. I think that's fraud. I think that's fraud. You should file your H1B through employer B, get it approved, and travel on that, ideally even get a visa stamp on that. Uh, Raj has another question. Okay, um, guys, I'm sure Raj, you're already here. So anybody who has a follow-up questions on everything that I have just discussed, posted, um, Raj, you can ask me your questions again. So anybody who has any follow-up questions, press star five. No new questions. No new questions, only follow-ups. Star five, please. Press star five if you have any follow-up questions. I have three set of people, four, four set of questions, four people. Okay, once, uh, please do not wait. Just raise your hand. If you do it, it's a toggle. If you press star five and then press it again, it goes off. So make sure your hand is raised. I've got five, five people with raised hands right now. Okay, once I'm done with these people, these folks, then we can start on new question. All right, let's start first with uh, Florida. Florida, go ahead, please. Florida. Oh, um uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if this is supposed to be only for up for the last question or any question. No, no, no. Only the questions that have been posted, all of them. All the questions. Okay, so yeah. uh, I just want to clarify regarding the uh, that, uh, W1099. After the EB2 visa is approved, um, and then let's say, I mean, the all the requirements are, are met as far as the uh, full pay and the salary and the W2, and then the employer. I uh, would like to um, propose an additional, in addition to, to, the, to the original job, an additional um, responsibility that will be paid to 1099. Okay, um, hang on, hang on, hang on. For example, hang on. Uh, in this case. Sir, sir, hang on. Are you saying, I was not very clear, I couldn't hear you very clearly for some reason. Um, are you saying, once I get my green card, I want to get a 1099 along with my W-2? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Oh, yes. Once you get your green card, you can have your W-2 and 20 other 1099s. Nobody cares. Oh, so when you say green card, is that, same as, as say, is that ba basically the EB-2, the EB-2 visa is the green card? Yes. EB-2 is the category under which a green card is approved. So green card is approved okay. when, when your 485 is approved. Understood. Okay, so that's just so the only problem is if you're H1B, then that cannot be done. Exactly. When you're an H1B, you are stuck with a W2. But when you have a green card, you can have W2, 1099, whatever you like. Okay, then my last question is just for the H1B, but it's kind of the same question. If you are meeting all the requirements as far as the salary and you, you are being paid 
even or even more than everything that was required by the H1B salary that is all net. And then the employer offers you an additional job, but that is pay 99, but that's in addition. Is that still not allowed? Still not allowed. Uh, they can pay you Understood. they can pay you additional money. See, for an employee, getting paid more than what is required by law is not a problem. You can be paid any amount, and they can always oh. they can always write bonus checks if they like. Uh, any amount of bonus is okay. Oh, okay. I've had cases okay. where, where a physician was making okay. two hundred fifty thousand base salary, but six hundred thousand dollars in bonuses. That's fine. Even on H one B. He was on H one B. Yes. Okay, so the only requirement is that the minimum is met on W-2. That cannot be combined. It has to be only on W-2. Beyond that minimum that was determined for the job, whatever. Well, even on the W-2, they can add bonus as much as they want. Oh. Okay. Okay, okay but if, if, for example, the salary is 30000 a year, you cannot have 20000 as full time employee and 10,000 on 1099 and say that together is 30,000 and meeting the requirement. That is correct. You cannot do that. It's got to be on W-2. You can have 30,000 on W-2 and another 50,000 in bonuses if you want. All, also on W-2. I understand. Okay. I understand. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good luck. Okay. Uh, we have five more people. So nobody on Twitter. Just following that as well. Let's see. I'm going in the order people logged in. Next one is, oh, Illinois just dropped their hand, I think. Oh, well. Um, let's go to another Illinois. Illinois, go ahead, please. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, this is Raj. Actually, when you explained me uh, the loss of this disturbance, so I haven't got like uh, no what problem. you explained. I, I, don't mind, I don't mind repeating if there was disturbance. Uh, Raj, uh, which question number were you? Can you remind me? Uh, I went 40. Uh, my question was uh, like uh, my employer. I'm planning to uh, leave uh, my uh, employer and my I went 40 was approved uh, eight months ago. So what all damage my present employer can do and how I can uh, retain my priority date and what all documents I must have uh, is before I'll join the new employer. Even if you had no document, the fact that your I-140 has been approved would have been sufficient to get you your prior to date transfer. But here's the problem. What I pointed out to people was this. Five years ago, USCIS used to say that if I-140 is revoked by the employer, the priority date is gone. Then about five years ago, they changed their mind and they said, no, 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 you can retain your priority date even if the old employer revokes the I-140. The only time we will not let you carry forward the priority date is if, number one, we revoke your I-140 for fraud or, number two, we revoke it because it was approved erroneously. Okay. So, first they, they, they thought that if the I-140 is revoked, the priority date is gone. Then they changed their mind and they said, well, only if there's fraud or error, we'll take away our priority date and the employer's uh, revocation doesn't mean anything for priority date purposes. But now I just saw them flip back again. I did a consultation today. I was telling people where this issue came up and not only are they not giving this guy his citizenship, they want to take away his green card because he has a similar issue and they said, well, your old employer revoked your priority date, so you can't use that priority date for getting the green card. You got the green card by error. What a strange situation. Okay, so what I told you was, I said, sit tight, wait about, either you can go to your own lawyers and have them research what the current thinking of USCIS is, uh, or you can wait for about week, 10 days for us to research this issue because we are probably going to file an appeal for that guy who has got a denial of his um, citizenship because his priority date was bound to a revoked I-140. 
So that's where you stand. Does that make it clear? Yeah. So, uh, so this, uh, so what you suggest, like, uh, should I change my uh, job? No, not my job? not until this issue has been thoroughly researched. And where I can track this issue, like you, you uh, cannot. You need to get a lawyer. To, you need to get a lawyer. It's difficult for you to change a job. Okay. And what I'm telling you okay. is that we are already researching this issue. If you wait, I'll give you my research free of cost. So why do you want to get somebody else to do it? You know. I'll post okay. it on my blog. Uh -huh. Just follow my blog. I'll post it on my blog. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, we have four more folks. Let's go to Virginia. Go ahead, please, Virginia. Hi. Thank you, Aditi. Um, my question is uh, Prasad121. Um, there are uh, other questions. Uh, Prasad, there. what is, what is the, the what, hang on. What is, oh, I got it. I have it in front of me. Um, H1B EAD. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. You're right. I missed some questions. Okay, thank you. Um, again, so I'm back to client A, but with vendor C. Planning to visit India and have visa stamp on my passport. LCA done, but my employer needs to file for an amendment too. Okay, I'm not quite clear about your facts, Prasadji. Are you saying, let's see. You work with client A, but your vendor was also A. Okay. You got the approval. Then you change to client B with different vendor B. Now you're back to client A, but the vendor is C. Yes, you should do an amendment, sir. An H1B amendment is needed. I have to do that. But the client is the same client where yeah. I applied for this but, one. But when but I applied the administration, uh, the client is the same. Prasadji, here is the problem. The reason, in my opinion, an amendment is needed is this. USCIS wants to confirm employer-employee relationship. Every time there's a change in the whole cha chain, employer, vendor, Contractor, subcontractor, prime, client. Anytime there's a change in any of these, I think an H-1B amendment is required. Okay. Okay. Um, the second question, yes, thank you, Rajiv. On the second question, you, meant, you did mention that uh, H-1B people can apply 485 as soon as the immigration, um, the Obama immigration reform happens. But uh, do we know any idea of when that could be possibly be uh, applied? Let me clarify that. What uh, the good president said on 21st November was this. He said, I am going to let people file I-485 without waiting for their priority date to be current, as long as the I-140 is approved or about to be applied. So you can, you, you, the only difference in his policy and today is that uh, you don't have to wait for your priority date to file 485. Now, the question is, when does this when is this likely to get implemented? That's something which is very difficult to predict. We have been hearing from USCIS that they are working on it. And we have seen changes come slowly in the policy of the government. First came the H4EAD, but that was the regulation already pending. Then came the L2 memorandum uh, a week ago, uh, which also is very helpful to businesses. Um, I'm hoping, Prasadji, that the changes are coming, they are in the works. I don't know where. I can't. I can't tell you anything about that. Okay, the H one EAD and H four EAD uh, rules and regulations are really changed, or it cannot be different. Um, talk to me when this is actually implemented. I think the EAD rules are going to be same, but I think H four EAD will probably have more freedom than the H H1485 year. I'll explain when the time comes, but uh, they are they are going to be, I think, slightly less open with the H1485 EAD than they are with H4 EAD. It's not because of the nature of the EAD. It's because of the nature of your H1. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but last question for this. Um, so if if I transfer my H1 to H4 EAD. 
if I visit India, do I need to have any visa stamping or any? Because on my passport, there is no visa right now. I have only I-797 valid. As long but as if I come back to Expo EAD, you don't need a visa stamping unless you travel outside US. Okay. Now remember okay. one one thing I want to point out. One big difference in H4 EAD and H1 I-485 EAD is this: when normally get you for get when you when you normally get your 485 based EAD, you also get advanced parole. You're not going to get that with H4. Okay. So advanced parole is still tied to your 485. That means when you travel, you do need a visa stamp whether it is H1 or H4, depending upon your status. But if you're in the United States and you change status, you don't need a visa. Okay. All right. Good Thank day. you so much. You're welcome, sir. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Okay, no worries, guys. Three more uh, people, then we'll start with the new questions. Um, California, go ahead, please. Hi, Rajendri. This is Robert uh, from uh, Mountain View, California, and this is regarding question number 23, where I was, I'm hoping to do a change of status for my wife from H1, F1 to H4, uh, and there right. were more questions in that. Uh, right, I saw those questions. So the question was, I couldn't get the response about when you said uh, for 485, 485 filing for my wife, H4 is better than H F1. I right. couldn't understand the let reason me, behind it and yeah, what was... Yeah, uh, it's a little difficult to explain, but let me try. Let's look at, since I'm sure you are either a science or a um, um, IT guy, let me approach the problem scientifically. Let's put the 485 in the middle and H4 and F1 on the sides. If you look at just the 485, 485 doesn't care whether you are coming from H1 side or F1 side. For, from looking at the, the, the point of view of filing a 485, it does not matter whether you are on H4 or F1. Okay. Now, if we change the viewpoint and we say, not only do we want to file 485, we want to maintain our H1 or our, our, our H4 or our F1. That's where the problem comes. And I, uh, I, didn't, I didn't get that. So the voice is not very clear right now. Oh, so okay. I didn't get that part me, of it. Let me move closer to the speaker. Uh, let's put it this way. 485 doesn't care which status you are on. Okay? But if, okay. You, if you want to simultaneously maintain that status, then H4 is better. What that means is you can maintain H4 status as well as 485 at the same time, but you cannot maintain F1 and I-485 at the same time. So once you file 485, your F1 is dubious. But that's okay. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. that's that's okay. We don't really care because you are legal once you file the 485. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so the follow-up question was a uh, similar thing. Like, for example, uh, I have already filed my 485. I'm waiting for dates to become current. And I'm hoping that someday uh, when the dates become current, I can file my wife's 485 uh, during that month. So let's say I filed my uh, uh, 485 for my wife, and the dates after filing her the uh, 485 for her, the dates move back again. Let's say, for example, something beyond my priority date again. So, uh, so her status will be like she has filed her 485, but the dates have gone back, so she's just waiting. So now uh, I am hoping that she can be on F4 status, and and meanwhile, if I get my green card, so uh, what happens to her status? Okay. Um, first of all, uh, once 485 is filed, she is an authorized period of stay. Even if the priority dates slip back, she will get her green card once the priority dates become current again. Okay. In the meantime, uh, if you got uh, but that may take another two. Yes, it can take time. In the meantime, if you got your uh, green card approval. Uh, just make sure you don't apply for naturalization if it's going to take so much time. Okay. So, okay. so that's, that's you know, um, that becomes a little complicated. But the 485 itself, no problem at all. 
uh, the only way, the only way there can be a a, a kind of a a, a slippery this uh, harmony in this situation is that in that brief period when the priority dates became current your green card got approved but hers did not that's a very right. very unlikely situation it can happen it happens but very unlikely okay and if such a thing happens and uh, so her h4 is no longer valid and but and so uh, her status will be uh, i don't know some uh, but if she can still stay in US, like if such a thing happens, like yes. the dates move back yes. and I got my green card. Yes, yes. She's entitled to stay in USA as long as her 485 is pending. On top of that, she's entitled to travel and come back as long as her advanced parole is valid. And on top of that, she's entitled to work as long as her EAD is valid. Oh, okay. Okay, that's great. So, okay. And uh, as... Conclusion like uh, to whether to be on F4 or F1 uh, for 485 filing, it's better to be H4 so that she can maintain the status while the 485 is pending. Well, even is there, right? even there, the interesting issue is she would lose her H4 status if you get your green card. Right. And she will lose her H4 right. if she starts using her EAD. But, you know, in either case, it's not a big deal because her status, it's actually referred to as authorized period of stay, comes from the fact that she has a 485 pending. She doesn't really need you at that point of time. Okay, 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 got it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Raj. Thank oh, you a lot. You're welcome. Just call me Raj. Go off the mistake. All right. Good luck. Thanks, Arisha. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, let's go on to... Two more people are uh, in the line. Let's go to Illinois. Illinois, go ahead, please. Illinois. Illinois. Okay, maybe they don't hear me. I have actually two people from the same city in Illinois. Uh, Illinois, go ahead, please. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, I can hear you. Do you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you fine. Yeah. Uh, so, we spoke a couple of months back on this forum. And uh, I came back in India after using four and a half years uh, of H1. I'm sorry. You're gonna and have I was up. advised to you. No new questions. How many times do you have to say the same thing? Okay. I'm going to invite new questions at this time. Okay. So, until I do so, please don't ask me a question. All right, uh, I still have, I'm going to put down everybody's hands. Let's see, I have one more raised hand from someplace. Okay, this is also from Illinois. No new questions, folks. Don't press star five again, wait. Uh, yeah, Illinois, follow up question, go ahead, please. Another? Hello? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Yeah, I I, I have a, kind of a different question about the last action rule. Am, am I allowed to ask? No, 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 not right now. Let me put your hand down. Uh, I'm going to invite one last time. Any follow-up questions? There is one more. Minnesota, go ahead, please. Minnesota. Okay, Minnesota just got dropped. All right, uh, guys, any, oh, one more hand came up again. Illinois, go ahead. No new questions, only follow-ups on what we have discussed. Okay. All right, everybody's hands are down. At this time, anybody has any question, press star five, please. Anyone with any question, press star five. One, two, three, four, five, six, Okay, six, seven, seven people. Seven people with new questions, no problem. Okay, please keep in mind, I am not taking any more questions after this. These are the only seven people. We will uh, take their questions. Oh, eight now. Um, okay, these eight people, then we are done. Um, we exceeded the time a little bit, but that's okay, I don't mind. Um, all right, back to seven. Somebody dropped their hand. All right. 
So once again, I remind you guys, this is a um, um, a toggle. When you press star five, your hand goes up. When you press star five again, it goes down. Okay, let's start in the order people logged in. Florida, go ahead. Florida. Hi, yes, uh, just uh, kind of two uh, additional questions. Just one, you may have answered, and maybe I just misunderstood about the uh, uh, EB2 green card approved. Uh, just to give an example, it's because I know that on the labor certification, there is a predetermined salary, for example, if it's $50,000, um, that's the annual salary. And after that, it is approved, then everything uh, comes into effect. Um, and at that point, just and you may have answered, I just want to clarify, is it okay uh, for the W-2 and the 1099 question, is it okay to make half of that on W-2 and half of that as 1099, no problem after the EB-2 is approved? Well, I think so. I think so. I think ideally, I would like you to make that salary on a W-2 as long as you can, a couple of months at least. Um, but even if you went on 1099, part of the time, I think you'll be okay. That's a guess. I cannot guarantee that would be legally accurate. Okay, I understand. So just to my second question, if something such as the labor certification is done in a few months, if not more, maybe a year before you know, the green card is actually um, approved and completed. So during that time, things change. And let's say once everything is approved and you actually start working for the employer, now you make less than the 50000 is that okay or is that a violation? You must make a case whatever was determined on the labor certification and, and the I. Uh, so, so, so let me rephrase your question. Once I get my green card approval um, and I change employers or you know I start my own work and I'm making less than 60000 is that okay? And the answer is yes. There is no law that you have to make 60000 all your life. Okay. Oh, uh, what if it's the same employer, but you just now making less than what, what was? Uh, not with the paper. same employer. That could be that could be a problem if it comes up. Normally, it does not come up, but that could be a problem that raises all kinds of issues. Okay, so okay, I understand. So only if it changes, then it would be considered okay to make a uh, the same employer. No, I, I would say so. That would be my guess. So I've got to move on. I've got a bunch of people waiting. Okay. okay, good luck. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, so we've got six more people. Let's go to the next one. Illinois, go ahead, Illinois, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. Yeah, Mr. Rajiv, thanks uh, for all these answers. But uh, I have a question about uh, the last action rule. Yes, sir. Uh, my my H4 is, uh, I was on H1B with the, with the university and I resigned in March and I applied for my H4, which is pending. Okay. And uh, in, in the meantime, I found, I got another job at another university. So they applied for my H1B yesterday with premium processing. So I'm hoping to get that within a couple of weeks. But my H4 is still pending. So what if what if my H four gets approved later? Then according to the last section rule, I will have to go back to H four and stop working for uh, on H one. How can I stop that uh, from happening? Well, it's a difficult situation. I don't have an easy answer for you. Um, the only thing I can recommend to talk to your lawyers about is this: ask them if. Um, during the H-1 process, at a certain point of time, it is okay for you to just revoke your H-4. Send a letter to the government saying, please, I, I hereby withdraw my H-4. Um, that way you will have the H-1 application pending only. But this is not an easy situation to handle. I'll tell you why. If you are in between statuses, your H-1 is gone, H-4 is pending. You really are not on full legal status. You are in authorized period of stay. And you cannot go from authorized period of stay to H-1. So chances are, if on the date your H-1 is approved, your H-4 is already not decided in your favor. USCIS will approve the H-1, but they'll make you go outside for visa stamp. And 
In any case, if that is the likelihood, then even if H4 is approved after H1, no big deal. You can go get your H1 visa stamp and come back. You're back on H1. Last action. Okay. 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 Yeah. So, so what I understood is like if my H1, my H1 gets approved now, and then later my H4 gets approved, let's say in June or July, then I can leave the country and come back with my H1 stamp. That is correct, and you'll be back on H1. And then, uh, and then. Uh, uh, is there any like time period that I'll have to wait before I go out, out of the country to get stamped? You can go even now and wait outside for your H1 visa stamp. It's not a problem. You can go. Okay. Ahead. Okay. Just, just a quick follow-up question. Uh, uh, by the time my H4 comes, if it comes, my wife will have already resigned from her job and she will... Because she's going to move with me, and she's going to re resign, and then she will lose her H1, H1, current H1. And then she will move with me, and then as soon as I get my new H1, we're planning to apply for H4 for her. You, I think you're going to have a problem, because there might be a period there, and I'm going to have to make this the absolute last comment. I have to take the next. I've got six more people waiting. <clears throat> um, I think you're going to have a problem because there would be a period where she'll be out of status. Okay. So my recommendation would be okay. to have her resign only after you've got your H1. Once you have your H1, she can file the H4 online and resign the same day if she wants. Yeah, that's what we're planning to do. But the, but my question was, like, what if later my H4, which I'm trying to withdraw, if that gets approved, but my wife does not have that H1 on, on, on the date. Have, have, have her travel with you. You get your H1 visa stamp. She gets her H4 visa stamp. I've got to go. Good luck, sir. Okay. Okay, okay folks, keep your questions short, please. Um, next one is California. California, go ahead, please. Oh, I, oh, I can hear you. Hello. California, go ahead. Yeah, uh, basically this was uh, just a follow-up question uh, regarding the green card in EB1 category. I'm already on in my visa. Um, the, the, the thing is, like uh, you said that uh, from the uh, uh, green card perspective, they don't look at the client that we are working on. It is just for the organization. But uh, uh, so if that, uh, how like? Even if I'm at a client place, I don't, uh, they don't care whether it's a client or, or the company. I, I mean, I just report how many people are reporting to me at the company level. They don't care, no. What matters is what is your place within your own hierarchy, not within the hierarchy of a third party. Okay. I have nothing else to add. That's how it goes. So I don't even need to show which clients, uh, what clients I'm working for, and how many people report to me in the client. It's just at the company level, so they right? You don't need to show anything other than your own hierarchy. If you choose to show all that information, I think that's okay. But it's not going to help your case for an EB1. Okay, and uh, it doesn't matter, right, whether those people are reporting those people reporting to me are at on-site or in India based and offshore, it should not matter, right? They do not consider people offshore as part of your team. They will not allow that as a consideration on your EB1 application. Not currently. They might change. Oh, they don't allow you? Yeah. So if you are managing 100 people or 200 people in Russia and three people in USA, you are managing three people. Sorry, if, if I'm managing three people in Asia and one people in no, US? If, if you are managing, yes. sir, if you are managing, I'm going to have to make it short again. 200 people you are managing in Russia or India, if that works better for you. You are managing 200 people in India, but three people in USA, you are managing only three people. We don't care about people in India. 
Okay, so, so, so sorry, the web was a bit uh, 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 You said that it should be okay still if I manage to take people. I didn't say that. But we are having a totally different discussion, sir. Your question to me was this. Okay. Does it matter if I, if, can I put people I manage in India as a part of my hierarchy? The answer is no. They are not a part of your hierarchy. They don't consider that to be like that. You can state it, but it won't be counted. Okay. It's not okay. It is not going to be counted. What your case is, I do not know. But the question you are asking me, I'm answering. So, how many okay. people you manage in India is irrelevant. How many people you manage in USA is only thing they'll look at. I gotta go. Okay, uh, guys, I'm getting a little tired. Um, please make your questions brief. Let me, we have got four more people left. Back to Illinois. Illinois, go ahead. Hello. Yes, go ahead, sir. Yes, uh, regarding question number seven. Uh, so basically a couple of uh, months ago we spoke and I was advised to use the remainder option. I have about a year and a half left. Okay. I'm currently in India. Okay. And most of the companies I'm talking to, uh, they are not uh, thinking about starting the green card process immediately. So can I do that uh, one time in the US on my own on EB2? Oh, I'm sorry. I did not answer that part of the question. My apologies. And the answer is no. You need an employer for EB2 and EB3 categories unless you are filing a national interest waiver, which you are not. And um, the only categories where you don't need an employer are EB1 extraordinary ability or EB5. Um, you know, so basically everybody who is an EB2 or an EB3, other than a national interest member, has to have an employer file the application. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you. You're welcome. Guys, I like questions like that that are over in just a couple of seconds. It'd be great if you guys can keep it like that. Okay, last two uh, people. Uh, this is Florida. Florida, go ahead, please. Um, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Um, how are you? I'm well, sir. Thank you. How are you? I'm good, sir. Thank you so much. A uh, small question uh, regarding filing 485. Mm -hmm. uh, can you file 485 in advance uh, when I get uh, I-140 approved and uh, until the target date is not correct in that case? Well, that's what we are hoping that President Obama will implement. That's what he said he will implement. As of now, you cannot. Once President Obama implements it, you'll be able to file 485 once the I-140 is either filed or approved without waiting for priority date to be current. Okay. Um, why I ask this question? Because uh, during this call, I heard someone saying that he has filed 485, but he is waiting for the date to become current. So I didn't understand that. Yeah, see, what happens What happens is, I don't know if you were here in 2007. We had a very odd situation. In 2007, just as an example, all the priority dates became current for just one month. And then they went back being um, not current for six, seven, eight years. So it's some, something like that. They filed their 485, then the priority date slipped back. Okay. 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 All right. That's fine. Thank you so much. Good luck, sir. Good. Now, this is the way the question should be. All right. Uh, Kansas. Kansas, go ahead, please. Hi. Um, my name is, um, I basically, uh, this is regarding my year of birth. It's incorrectly stated in my passport. It's 1978, but what's stated is 1979. Uh, I got married last year, uh, and my husband is a green card holder. We are in India currently in the temporary assignment, but he plans to go to, back to the U.S. The problem is that the confusion started because I was got, born in Assam, which is um, in India, and it's in vernacular language, and somehow there has been a problem, and uh, my passport has a wrong year of birth. I have entered the U.S. twice since 2011 on a tourist visa, uh, but now I'm extremely worried because they have my records, and if I change my passport, I I might as well just wash away my green card. So I'm really worried. Could you no, please? no, 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 no. I I think you'll be okay as long as there is the good explanation. 
Um, I don't think you right. need, need to worry so much about it. Um, if you get the passport corrected, uh, you know what would be really, sure. really nice if you could get a court order of some kind, uh, like a declaratory injunction. Yeah. A declaratory injunction sure. that, ma'am, let me finish. Uh, a declaratory injunction that says that XYZ had an incorrect date of birth in the records, which is now being corrected or is being directed to be corrected. That way, if you can carry that court order with you, that will make things a lot easier for you, I think. So, personally, I think um, even if you went for just a um, passport correction, and carried both the old and the new passport with you, you'll be okay. Uh, but top that uh, with even a, a better guarantee would be a, a court order, okay? So so what you say, thank you for that. That's really reassuring. So what, what I just understand, and I'm gonna be very, very quick here, is that if I get my court order, and if I change my maiden name, and, and I you know, get into my married name, and I change my year of birth, and I have two passports and a court order, uh, you know, it should not be looked at suspiciously. Oh, no, so, no. Okay. You know, the chances, I mean, I just no. don't want a situation where it gets rejected. No, 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 no. You will not be rejected on that basis. Uh, see, what happens is, this yeah. is my understanding. And contact me if that's not the way it is. Normally, when you get the passport corrected, they cut off a portion of the old passport and give you both the new passport and the old passport back. Correct. Okay, so that way, now we have proof yeah. that this is the same person whose passport was changed. Okay. Okay. On top so of that... Just because I've entered the U.S. twice... That's okay. Sorry. So what? So what? So what? So they won't say that I've entered on an incorrect uh, an no, they can, document they or can, something like that? They can say anything they want. But that does not render you inadmissible. As long as you do not lie about anything when they ask you, you're honest yeah, about it. Yeah, I wouldn't it. want to do that. I wouldn't worry about it. It's irregular, but it's not illegal. You haven't done anything wrong. Yeah, but you can't say that you went to the U.S. twice and on the wrong passport and you didn't know about this. Ma'am, And now you're saying that you're changing it. I, it is my judgment this will not, yeah. not be a problem. All I can tell you is my judgment. Um, I cannot... Of course, I appreciate that. Yeah, this is not mathematics. This, oh. is, this is a judgment um, call. And in my view, this is not going to be. It's not an issue. Okay. Nope. All right. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that. You're very welcome. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. Guys, uh, it's always a delight to talk to all of you. Oh, there's still one left. No, we just did that. Okay. Um, I'll talk with you again in two weeks. I'm sorry, a little, little getting a little tired. We went about an, half an hour over, uh, but that's okay. Um, try to keep your questions short so that we can um, basically answer everyone's questions. Okay. Thank you for being here. See you in two weeks again, uh, next to next Thursday. Bye-bye. Every other Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we host um, free community conference calls. Everybody is welcome to join. Some people post questions ahead of time. You can take membership in our forums. Uh, all of the details are there on our website, immigration.com. You can take membership. Uh, ahead of time and um, you know it's instantaneous it happens right away and post your questions beforehand or you can just log in uh, the phone number in all are provided 202-800-8394 12 30 eastern standard time every other thursday we have uh, free apps for both apple ios platform for your iphones and ipads as well as for Android. Just look for immigration.com, immigration.com, the period dot, and uh, the application should show up.